coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. And so he covers all of that in, in, in chapter one, and then he gets to chapter two and he talks about what true religion is, taking care of the widows and orphans in one and, and, and these things, and setting that in order for you to operate in this thing we call Christianity, you got to have some priorities. Let the church say priorities. Priorities. Ah, uh, Christ did not die for the haves and then kiss, kick the have nots off to the side. He died for the haves and the have nots. time that we're going to spend together <coughs> digging into the word, I want to talk a little bit about faith. Yeah. Amen. Just do it. All right. <laughs> All right. Come on. I, I, I'm a lectionary preacher, so I, I, would, I would love to say that I wrote this sermon in response to, you know, uh, Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the scores of angry people yeah. who are mad that Nike would continue to pay him during yeah. his peaceful protest uh, that, that was he was kneeling because of, of a military serviceman um, telling him to kneel because that was showing more respect than sitting. I would love to say that I wrote that. This, this sermon in response to that and I, I, that I wrote this sermon in response to people who are mad at peaceful protests but not mad at police brutality. Amen. I yes. would love to say I wrote the sermon in response yes. to that, but I really didn't. Mm -hmm. It's all right. I mean, I, 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 if, if you can't tell where I stand on the matter, it, it should be crashingly clear. <laughs> but um, I would love to say that. You know, you don't, you don't protest a, a bunch of other atrocities, but somebody puts Thank on you. some shoes. And I'm just Thank wondering, who could you possibly, what shoes could you wear? Because mm -hmm. Jay-Z is now the spokesperson for Puma. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so uh -huh. you, you're not going to find too much support there. And then Adidas has already stepped out his way. And, and Under Armour has stepped out the way because they got Steph Curry as their spokesperson. Mm -hmm. And so if Nike, I mean, maybe New Balance. <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe. Skechers. Yeah, well. I don't know. But I, I didn't write the sermon because of that. I didn't. Come on. I didn't. It's all right, Pastor. I, I, I did not. I'm a fan of James, not as not as big as a fan of, of, of James as I am of John, but J James is in there, you know, because you can read James in your own private time in one city. And it's a whole bunch of stuff packed up in there, talking about the tongue being a, a, a small deal, but it, 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 it moves the whole, but it's strong enough to break bones, and talking about what <laughs> pure religion was, and, and, and one of my favorite verses. And James, faith without works is dead. Yeah. Uh, but just do it. A uh, famous Nike slogan that goes all the way to an advertising campaign back in 1998, which was, I mean 1988 rather, which was inspired by somebody's last words. Uh, just do it. Uh, I like that phrase. It, it, it means so much saying so little. Uh, one of my other favorite athletes, a running back, an NFL running back by the name of Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch despised doing interviews. Uh, the team that he was playing for at one time made it all the way to the Super Bowl, and he kept walking out of the interviews, and they finally told him, you're going to have to get these interviews done because we'll find you if you don't. And he said, okay, and got up there, and every question they asked, Marshawn Lynch, how do you feel about X, Y, Z? Well, I'm just here, so I won't get fined. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you feel about this, your opponents coming up today? I'm just here, 
because I don't want to get fined. I'm here so I won't get fined. And I remember Deion Sanders decided he was going to take the homeboy approach to talk to him about it and, and, and try to catch him off to the side while he was doing interviews. And he was like, I hear, Marshawn, that you do a whole bunch of work in the community and give money to underprivileged community centers and help kids in, in bad neighborhoods. And you want to talk a little bit about that? He said, no. If you want to see something about that, come on down and see when I'm down there. So, so, so he was became one of my favorite athletes, also known as Beast Mode. Uh, but one of my favorite phrases that came from him, besides "I'm just here because I won't get fired," Marshawn, <laughs> why don't you want to do these interviews? Because I'm about that action, boss. Amen. And so I thought about all of these things as this passage came up in, in the lectionary and, and, and we're reading James chapter 2, but in the preceding chapter, uh, James is telling the people what true religion is in the preceding chapter. And in the verses uh, 1, 25 and 26, he says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this religion is useless. So if you think that you got some good religion, but you always trying to talk bad about somebody. If you think that you got some good religion, but you got all the gossip that you sharing about everybody and knowing what's going up all and down the street, that religion is useless. And he says on in 27, that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Why take care of widows and orphans? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Well, back during these times, uh, this was what we would call a big old $5 word, a patriarchal society, which meant if you was going to make any kind of money or do anything for yourself, you had to be a man. Women weren't necessarily allowed to work and children were not old enough to work, which came, which pro uh, provided a problem if the man of the house died. Because if the man of the house died, that meant that that widow was no longer capable of taking care of themselves and that child was no longer capable of taking care of themselves. They couldn't just go out and get a, a part-time job and, and the mom worked two jobs and, and do something to keep the family afloat. That wasn't happening. And so they said that this thing that we later learned to call Christianity, uh, pure religion, and this thing that we call Christianity was to take care of those who could not take care of themselves. Amen. That was what true religion was. You want to become a believer. You want to show everybody that you believe in Jesus Christ. You want to show everybody that you are a good Christian. It ain't about what suit you wore to church. It ain't about what church you go to. It ain't about those things, these titles that you have. What are you doing for the least, the last, and the lost? Amen. And so he covers all of that in, in, in chapter 1, and then he gets to chapter 2, and he talks about what true religion is, taking care of the widows and orphans in one, and, and, and these things, and setting that in order for you to operate in this thing we call Christianity, you got to have some priorities. Let the church say priorities. priorities. Ah, Christ did not die for the haves and then kiss, kick the have-nots off to the side. He died for the haves and the have-nots. And in a nutshell, he talks about in the passage that we read, he talks about passages, acts of favoritism and partiality that result in dishonoring the poor within a Christian context. Brethren, if there's somebody should come into your assembly, a man with gold rings and fine apparel that should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one in the fine clothes, and you disrespect the one in the lower, the, the poor clothes, you are not you are showing partiality. He talks about failure to keep the whole law instead of choosing bits and pieces. And this practice does not honor the divine law. And he talks about not showing mercy. And he talks about paying lip service to one's faith and not expressing that faith through good works. But all of it can be summed up in one final sentence by itself. Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. dead. Amen. Amen. And this criteria for analyzing whether or not your faith is alive or dead is not just for you to point the finger at somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
It's also to take some introspective look, uh, introspective look at yourself. Amen. All right. So he talks about this godless favoritism. Uh, and, and there's a command against it. And, and the readers are doing the following things. They're treating these great, these rich visitors with great respect. And, and we still do that from time to time. I, 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 I'll give you an example. We, we think that because somebody's a good businessman and that they're rich, that they would make a good president. Uh-oh. Yes, Lord. Then they do. Uh-oh. Yes, they do. Come on, now. And it's We listen to celebrities on matters of policy because they're a celebrity. Now, I'm not saying that celebrities should not be out in front speaking about social justice. But if the only reason you get involved in some is because your favorite singer or your favorite rapper said to do it, your priorities are a little messed up. All right. The Leviticus 19 and 15 says is that judges are not supposed to discriminate between the rich and the poor. But we do it all the time. We looking at what kind of car somebody drives, what kind of clothes they got on, what kind of shoes are they wearing, what kind of jewelry do they got on. And if they good, big and flashy, we assume that they know what they're doing. We assume that they got it going on. You can't judge a book by its cover. Amen. Amen. I remember reading a book by the, uh, that was called The Millionaire Next Door. And they, they interviewed hundreds of millionaires, how they operated, how they worked with the children, how they went to work, all of these different things that they were doing. And they bought some food because they rented out a conference room in a hotel. And they were going to interview all of these millionaires. And they got caviar. And they got uh, all kind of different things and, and expensive champagne and all these things to interview these, interv uh, these millionaires. And none of that food got eaten. Mm. They had, were asking them where did they shop. And they were expecting them to name off these, these custom clothing years and these expensive shoes and uh, they getting their shoes made from this place and flown in from all these places. They expected all these things, but when they actually interviewed the, the, the millionaires, you know what their favorite place to shop was? Mm -mm. Walmart. All right. <laughs> They were asking him what kind of food, and they was offering him caviar. And one of the guys said, I don't eat caviar. He's like, well, what kind of food do you like? I like hot dogs. Uh -oh. <laughs> and so they sit there, and they had to take all of this food that they spent on catering and give it to a brokerage uh, convention next door. The people who get hired by these millionaires to invest their money, and they ate it up. It was a bunch of Brooks Brothers shoots and suits and wing tips around over there, but the people that were actually doing it weren't that, spot, weren't that flashy about it. So you can't get caught up in what somebody wears thinking that they are successful, thinking that they know something about something. All right. uh, but he said if you pay attention to the ones with the gold rings and the fine apparels and the, the poor man in the filthy clothes, uh, you, you cast aside. There's plenty of people making good money that work on a plant. Yeah. Come home dirty. Yeah. You can't judge a book by its cover. You cannot show this kind of favoritism treating those who you think are wealthy with all kinds of respect and treating those who you think are poor with none. Amen. Uh, and it says that we're not supposed to judge with evil intentions. And then uh, James goes on to say that it's hypocritical to have that kind of allegiance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It says in verse 6, but have you dishonored the poor? And do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? During the time of the writing, it wasn't really hot to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. If you were publicly known to be a Christian, uh, or what well, they called it, those who were following the way. Uh, the, the, these people were oppressed. And sometimes they went after some of these wealthy people trying to convert them to Christianity to support the ministry. But not only were there those who they, they were trying to convert to Christianity to support the ministry, there were those who were wealthy who were oppressing them. 
Ah, uh, uh, let, let me, let me, let me. Explain. So, so uh, when Jesus, even when Jesus was being persecuted uh, uh, by the council, uh, if you read in the text, uh, they had that court, uh, that that council hearing in the living room of the the chief counselor's house. <laughs> the council at that time was uh, seventy two people. You got to have a, 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 a living room large enough for 72 people to sit in it and hold court. They were going after the rich people. But he says it's hypocritical to go after somebody just because they are rich, because it was the rich that were trying to oppress them. These people had evil thoughts in their mind. And we sit around still doing it today, trying to spend money that we don't have Come on. to buy things that we don't need to impress people who don't even like us to begin with. Meanwhile, there are people in need who go ignored. Yes. Yes. And James says through five and verses five and seven, he doesn't <laughs> understand this because if you're going after somebody just because they have money in their pocket, not, not because they have a desire for Jesus. They're going for him just because they have money in their pocket. And these are the people who ridiculed them and ridiculed their Savior. Mm. And while they are looking down on somebody less fortunate than them, there are people who are more fortunate than them looking down on them. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, and so James tells them to obey the Lord's royal command. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. The royal law. Laws having to do with a king or a kingdom. They asked Jesus in Matthew 22, Rabbi, which is the greatest law of it? And he said that there was the greatest law uh, was to love the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And the second one is like that, to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws hang all the, uh, uh, all the laws and the prophets. You got to love everyone as yourself. Love God, love people. And this is not some sort of high ideal. This is not something that is far off. This is very real to James. How can you say that you love God who you've never seen, but don't love your neighbor who you see every day? Amen. You are the only Bible some people will ever read. You are the only sermon some people will ever hear. You are the, somebody's perception of a Christian. You are somebody's definition of a Christian. How are you treating them? Love God. Love people. Don't show favoritism. And there are consequences to it. In 9 through 12, he says that to break this law is to break all the laws. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and stumble on one point is guilty of all. But he, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you will become a transgressor of the law. There is no sin that is greater than anyone else's. And this thing is not a trip to Luby's. <laughs> it's not a trip to Piccadilly's. It's not a vending machine. It's not a a la carte service at a cafeteria. There's no cafeteria plan for this. You can't decide, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to not do that. All right. Mm -hmm. Come on, preacher. We can't just take half the Bible and throw it away. Hello? Mm -hmm. Amen. No one sin is greater than another. Yeah. All right. And you don't have a heaven or a hell to put one in, Come anybody on. in to begin with. <laughs> but the response is to show a godly faith. Because if you show some mercy, you'll receive mercy. If you Amen. don't show mercy, you won't receive right. mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, this head faith by itself 
is, uh, is more than just using a bunch of empty words and showing some, some lip service if it's not accompanied by works. I can say I love my wife all the time, but if I don't do anything to prove it, do I really love my wife? The readers uh, in, in the text don't know what, what he means when he talks about faith and work, so he gives an example. You pull up to the stoplight, and you see the gentleman holding the sign. And, you know, instead of, you know, just easing off the gas so you can scoot your car up a little bit and not have to make eye contact with him uh, or, or, or praying that the light changes to green so you can burn off, he's saying these people would normally in this kind of situation roll their window down and say, be fed and clothed in the name of Jesus. And then mash the gas on off. <laughs> I, I'm, still, I'm still in the Bible. Uh, what does it profit my brethren if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of food and one says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which was needed? What does it profit? Nothing. We got to be about some action. Yes, we do. Got to be about some action. That is lip service if you just say be fed and clothed in the name of Jesus and you don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one Amen. any day. Amen. Amen. And matter of fact, sometimes words without action will make a situation even worse. Yes. I've been in some meetings lately with some people that are trying to do some mentoring for some young African-American men. And the person running the program said from jump, don't sign up for this if you can't commit. Because if you show up one time and don't ever show up again, you've done more damage than, than have not showing up at all. A half-finished job is worse than no job at all. Yes. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. We got to be about some action. We got to do it. And, it's, uh, and, and, and when we talk about it, this faith without works is dead. Some people have tried to make the argument that, that it's either or. Mm. It's not either or. It's both and. Yes. It's both and. You have the faith. You exercise the faith and you do something about it. Mm -hmm. So you got to have both the speech and the action together. Mm -hmm. If not, it's dead. Yes. Amen. And if something's dead, it's no longer moving. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when a person physically dies, they no longer move and they no longer communicate. Uh, and, and there's the so these things are saying that this this faith has to be a living, moving, breathing thing. Uh, the late Ethel Barrett, who was uh, well known for her skill in telling Bible stories to children, said it this way: You have a tongue in your head, but you have two tongues in your shoes. All right. And no matter what the tongue in your head is saying. Mm -hmm. The tongues in your shoes tell what you're doing and where you're going. And the awful truth about it is the tongues in your shoes have the last words. So you can't be impressed with photo ops, being invited to sit at the table, shake hands, and take pictures. You can't be impressed with people promising to do some things saying that they're going to provide support in these different areas. What are you going to do about it? Your shoes have the last word. Uh, there was a psychologist by the name of Alfred Adler who said, trust only movement. Life happens at the level of events, not words. Trust movement. Thus it follows that what we do tells more about the state of our faith than what we say. Mm. And indeed, that's what James meant when he was saying, so faith by itself without works is dead. Or as sometimes it's properly put, 
uh, we need not only talk the talk, but we need to walk the walk. And so this faith that we're doing, we have to exercise it and have some actions to accompany it. And it's a good time to remind us that the cornerstone of the Christian faith is resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, even dead faith can come alive again. And this is what James was trying to get at when he was talking about their faith being dead, that it was in need of a revival so that these believers could stop just only being believers and start becoming doers. Uh, there's an old fable about a man walking through a forest who saw a fox that had lost his legs. An old man wondered how the fox lived, and he saw a tiger come with some game in its mouth. And the tiger ate its fill and left the rest for the fox. And the man of the, uh, saw the hand of God in it, and he decided that he would rest in the corner with full trust, and the Lord would provide him for what he needed, just like that fox got provided. And he did it for a bunch of days, and nobody gave him anything. And when he was almost at death's door, he heard a voice say, Oh, you who are in a path of error, open your eyes to the truth. Follow the example of the tiger and stop imitating the fox. Mm. So this is what James was saying when he was talking about it. We sit around looking for somebody to come do for us mm -hmm. instead of trying to figure out what we can do for somebody else. All right. I'm in a bunch of different organizations and some people come with some interest in said organizations. But I know where the conversation's going to go when they come to ask me about said organization and they want to know what's the benefits of joining. What has joining this organization done for you? What benefit have you gotten? What kind of jobs have you gotten? What kind of financial benefit have you gotten? And those people, I turn a deaf ear to. Because right. if you come in to get involved in anything uh -huh. that I'm involved in, uh -huh. and all you're looking for is somebody else to do for you, uh -huh. you will not survive in said organization. Amen. Amen. That goes for church, yep. lodge, Amen. fraternity, Amen. business networking organizations. Mm -hmm. It's not about what they can do for you. It's about what you can do yes. for them. Amen. Amen. And you need to be doing for them because the greatest, most important thing has already been done yes. for you. Amen. Uh, there was somebody who came out of eternity yes. and put on human flesh. Yes. And, and lived a life that we could not live and died a death that we could not die and became the perfect sacrifice, a, a ransom for the life. He didn't just say, I think I'm going to come out of eternity because he was fine. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But the word decided instead of just being only the word, the word decided to become flesh and come dwell among us and show us what it was to live a life and do the things that we needed to do. He didn't just talk about it. He did it. And he got uh, 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 trumped up charges brought against him. But he did it. He took that beating with a cat of nine tails. There was no conversation about it. He actually did it. He actually wore that crown of thorns. He actually got crucified on Calvary. He actually did it. And he not just talked about it. He actually was about it. Everything that Jesus said he was going to do, he did. He healed the sick. He opened the blinded eyes. He set the captives free. He declared the acceptable year of the Lord. And he died for every one of our sins. But that's not the only thing he did. Three days later, he rose again. And that's not only the only thing he did. He's coming back again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come. Thank you for listening to this message. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you found this message. If this message blessed you, be a blessing to someone else and share it. Connect with Pastor Johnny on Instagram and Twitter, and be sure to like Faith UMC Dickinson on Facebook. 